Do you ever find yourself thinking like I should be at a different place than I am now? And that manifests itself in a multitude of different ways, uh, specifically that you're, you're, you're worried about oftentimes, or, or we are worried about, you know, maybe I shouldn't be here in the sense that, you know, we call it on one end, the imposter syndrome. So you find yourself in a situation where you're looking at your life, you're looking at the people that look up to you, you're looking at the, the friends that you have, or maybe the business opportunities in front of you, and you say to yourself, like, uh, if anybody knew, like me, you know, they, they would right away write me off. And we are deeply worried that people are going to find out, so to speak, who, who we truly are and what our capabilities are. If only, if only my, my, my kids would know, if only my wife would know, if only my business partner would know, you know, all the clients that I work with, like, you know, right away, they'd sort of like write us off. So that's piece number one. That's how it manifests in the first place. It's like, we have this sense, this concern, we call it the imposter syndrome, you know, that I shouldn't be where I am. And, and, and on, that means I'm, I'm, I'm above where I should be, and if, if only someone would figure out where I actually am, so then uh, you know, then I'd be dragged back to reality. And the scary thing is, for a lot of people, we spend a lot of our time as children feeling like we want to get to a certain place, uh, but we never really appreciate the process. And then we sort of look at our life and be like, "Wow, you know, like all of this stuff that that I." that I thought I wanted or that I, you know, hope to get to one day when I benchmarks that I've set for myself, you know, when you actually get there, you kind of look around, and you say, I shouldn't be here. Like I didn't, you know, I got lucky. I put in the work, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So the first concept is this idea of an imposter mentality. The second concept, which is also just as prevalent is the idea that we spend uh, we, we, we're not where we want to be on the other side of things. You know, that I, if only I had, let's say, a bigger following or more money, or if I was married, or if I was dating, or if I had a happier marriage, or if I had, uh, you know, kids, or I had kids that listened, or I had kids, X, Y, and Z. So a person finds themselves at, at any given time of the day, or let's say a person, a lot of people find themselves at any given time of the day, sort of cycling between, on one hand, I'm not good enough to be where I am. And on the other hand, I wish I was somewhere different. And practically speaking, what that does for us is it creates a variety of problems. It would be potentially depression in the sense that I feel awful about the stuff that I did. And the more that I think about it and the more that I reflect on you know, mistakes I've made in my life or decisions I should have made that I didn't or any of those kinds of concepts, the, 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 the sense of despair and challenge and frustration becomes in a lot of ways paralyzing. And on the other hand, when you think about, you know, the, the, where this is where anxiety comes from, is if you think about the future and you think, well, if I want to do that, there are a multitude of things I have to do, and I'm completely unqualified to do all of those, and there's no way I'm going to be able to figure it out, or it's going to take too long, or I'm not going to be able to build, so to speak, in the, the place or the systems or find the team or find the financing or find the support, any of that kind of stuff. So when we start to develop a vision for what we want with our lives, we're overwhelmed by all of this stuff that we don't know or that we don't think we can, we can have right now. So either way, you look at that coin, you have this challenge by which on one hand, you feel like you're not good enough in order to get to where you want, or you're frustrated, angry at yourself that you haven't achieved more things in your life at this juncture, right? Or the flip side is, and oftentimes these things co uh, are, are, are coexisting and just um, uh, pulls on the same challenge. We, we look at our lives, the things that are in our lives, and we feel like we don't deserve them. We don't belong here. We, 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 we shouldn't be there. So that's what I like to discuss is the future slash patient paradox. It's the name I came up with. And how does Judaism, how does the Torah, how does a person that, that is immersing themselves in spirituality, how do they relate to this kind of a con context and a concept? So that's a very important question. Why? Because ultimately, when a person is embracing and a person wants to live 
for for a Jewish re, you know for a Jewish life. So most people do not come and think about Judaism as I'm excited about more oppor- like things to do, right? Or I need an identity, or I want to join a gang. I'm gonna I'm gonna practice spirituality. It's like no, people don't do that. So you, the reason why a person ultimately is looking to enhance their spirituality oftentimes is that there's a hole in their life and there's a part of their life that's missing. And we might think to ourselves, well, that I don't want to come towards spirituality and weakness. I don't want to come just because something's not working for me. And I think that the first thing that a person has to consider is that we, with, with the right mentality, if we're able to be completely focused on where we want to be in our lives, we want to pick up cues from what's going on in our world to go in, to be deeper, to think more. And so if a person goes through their life and essentially is just bounced from one problem to another, they're always going to be reactive. There's a very fundamental Jewish book that gives the analogy of a wicked person. And again, be paid close attention to this concept because it's fascinating. A wicked person is like a tree, right, that has little roots. And a, and a wise person or a good person is like we, it, it, I'm sorry, let's go back the other direction. I got the analogy wrong, right? There's actually two, right? But there's one concept of a wicked person being like reeds on the sea and a, and a, and a wise person is like a tree which deep, with deep roots. And what is the difference? That a wicked person, a person that doesn't have a centering, they're blown around by everything. Every single environment is going to push them in this direction or that direction. And on the flip side, a person that is deeply rooted is able to stand through all of the storms. And what's their what's their foundation? It's the roots, right? If a tree has deep roots, it can stand up longer. This parallels beautifully to a concept in the early Jewish writings that speaks about that a person has to spend, just like, you know, they weren't using the example of a big building, but a person has to put down a very deep foundation in order for them to live a righteous life, meaning you cannot go up without first going down deep and setting up all of your fundamentals. So there's a basic principle as a person goes through their life, are they going to be bounced from here or there? Or are you going to set up roots so that you don't move as life comes towards you? Now, as life comes towards you, what are you supposed to do? So either you can say, well, I'm going to go over here, there, whatever, and I'm just not going to really have any kind of firmness in terms of how I go about my experience in life. Or what we could say is that I am going to develop tools where I'm going to build myself and that the things that come into my life, I'm going to utilize them as indications of things or opportunities or places that I could grow. That's why we say famously on Shabbat, we we quote one of the verses in Psalms, and it says that a righteous person is like a palm tree. What does that mean? So if you look at how palm trees, I don't know about this anymore, but back in the old days when I lived in California, right? So if you look at a palm tree, there's like different rings and going up, right? So the idea of a date palm, right? Which is that it one builds on the other. So there's a concept that a person goes through their life and they stay the same, but they are able to utilize experiences that come into their life to indicate to them what, where, or how they should grow. So a lot of times there's a principle and a premise out there that I shouldn't, you know, kind of turn, again, it's it's a fascinating concept that we in the, in the West build and, and deal with, this idea of a self-made man, that ultimately, and again, this is, a, this is a fascinating idea, right, that we think that I should be strong enough, I should be good enough, I should be able to figure all this stuff out myself. And really that's a fallacy, why? Well, let, before we get to the fallacy, what does it practically mean? Practically what what that means is that if something happens in my life and I need to seek outward support or I want to go back to my roots and I want to, you know, kind of seek out Judaism or connection or any of these kinds of things because of something that bad that happened in my life, we look at that as a sign of weakness. Like, oh man, you weren't strong enough to go through your life without any of this support. And the answer is like, no, not at all. If you're a deeply rooted person, you have developed the, the ability to see the challenges in your life or the opportunities in your life as an indications for how or where or why you should grow. And so that's a fascinating concept. So if a person is approaching spirituality, growth, because something's gone on in their life and they're able to think to themselves, maybe this is an opportunity for me to grow, 
right? So then they can come to that, not with all of the negativity that a lot of times we attach to when you're trying to reach out, but rather we can come to it with a sense of appreciation that, wow, this happened in my life and now let me look at it. I'll give a personal example in my own, in my own life, which was that, you know, the biggest thing that drew me initially to Judaism was that I saw married couples who were 50, some years old or less, that, that were speaking nicely to each other. Now, as a person that grew up in, in, a, in a home where I didn't see that, I was deeply affected by that. And I thought to myself, even if this whole system's not true, I'll buy into the lifestyle because I want that level of, I want that level of, of harmony, of, of, of marital connection. Now, what's really interesting is I found out retroactively, again, you could ask two questions on that, and I'm very open about this. On one hand, you could say, well, just because you saw that, does that mean that everyone in that system has it? The answer is like, well, obviously not. And the other side was, you know, if you were just triggered by that, there was a part in your past that that that, that drew you to this other side. Is, does, is that a good is that a good reason to do something? And 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 on the other hand, you could say yes, no, whatever it might be. So so watch watch this is a f phenomenal concept. Is ultimately you want to use your life as an indication for where you go. And so often we spend time trying to figure out what are my next steps and you're looking out on the horizon but the flip side is that that's not the place that you should look you want to learn how to look inside to yourself and be able to check in with yourself and say where am I now what do I need now and then once you sort of know what you're looking for then you're able to chart the course in which you are supposed to go so let's go, let's go here. So we, we mentioned that the person has a challenge in their life, which is often they don't feel centered. And again, the, literally it's a, it's a manifestation of that same concept that we just discussed. The, the idea that I'm looking outside in the world for where I'm supposed to go, which naturally means that I don't feel confident with where I am right now. Right. So if that if that is the case, we mentioned it will manifest in one of two ways and oftentimes simultaneously. You'll either think you have imposter syndrome. I don't belong in this position. I'm not good enough for this position. Or it will manifest in a sense of frustration that I'm in the situation I am now. I'm supposed to have done different. If only I hadn't all of these kinds of concepts. So this is where a person could turn to Judaism, could turn to spirituality and start to look at what are the principles that this teaches in order to deal with this exact challenge. So let's start with the fundamentals. The fundamentals is, we say in Hebrew, there's a word, the word for speech is the same as the word for thing. And you look, how did God start the creative process of building the physical world? He spoke it into existence. So there's a concept, and again, this is deep on a psychological level, this is deep on, on a spiritual level, that what we say becomes manifest and how we look at the future and how we talk about the future is ultimately what we live. So if a person is, is always thinking to themselves, it's going to be bad or always thinking to themselves, it's going to be good. You are naturally going to focus on those things and find things to validate right? To validate what your thoughts were. And you see that in the political sphere. You see that in every single sphere. So the very beginning and the fundamentals of any kind of growth is for a person to change and to alternate and to admit and to think about where do I want to get to? This idea of leveraging the future to create your, your present and then what comes afterwards. So if a person's able to, and again, this is like literally how the entire Bible starts. It's the most fundamental concept. And what does it start with? It starts by the cre creation of the physical world. So it's like the foundation of physicality is that you have to deploy future vision in order to create your physical world, right? That if a person is tapped in and they're thinking to themselves, well, I want to get to this place. I have a desire to get here. I want to be in, 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 a, in a different location. So leveraging that concept, talking about that, thinking about that, visualizing that, having, again, the idea is if you, let's just look at the other direction, obviously, to, to, to juxtapose the two approaches. If you think to yourself, right, I can't, I'm not able to. I'm never going to be. So the answer is yes, you're a thousand percent right. And then what comes next is that you lose hope. And if you lose hope, for sure you're done. So on, on the, 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 the greatest 
harbinger of the clouds of destruction is you lose hope. You don't have a vision for a future that could be better than where you are now. And if you don't have that, you are moments away from destruction. And that's why ultimately, again, we talk about Karl Marx famously talked about religion being the opiate of the masses. It's not. The opiate of the masses is when you don't have a future, when you're, when you're not able to visualize a world that's better than where we are today. What is that opiate? How does that opiate manifest itself, however? It manifests itself in, in, in drug or substance addiction. It manifests itself in depression. It manifests itself in just kind of tuning out and watching Netflix or other people's stuff on social media, right? Everyone has their heroin, so to speak, of how we, we, we deal with our own hopelessness or our own frustration or our own depression. But the realization is that all of that stuff, you know, I wish I would stop binge eating, right? Or something like that. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is that you've lost hope. The problem is that you are not able to articulate a world or a place that's better than right now. And if you don't have that, you don't, you, you, you're unable to grow. So the first piece for a person that feels like I'm not where I'm supposed to be, you have to realize if you go back to the very fundamentals of, of the Bible, right? You look at how God's creating the world, right? You see that you have to be able to speak into existence to develop a vision, a thought for what you want with your life. And the more specific it is, the better you can be get, the more you can envision it, the more you can think through, okay, what steps has to get there. Most people will live their whole life in a reactive state. And again, it's fascinating because we have reactive states in parts of our life and we have proactive states in parts of our life. You might not find across the board that you are entirely proactive or reactive, which is interesting. So oftentimes in the work that I do with, with, with CEOs, so I'll find someone that is a beast in business and they're able to set up a five-year plan and a 10-year plan and a vision and they're talking about technology that's going to be built out in the next 50 years and it's going to be so cutting edge and, you know, the patents don't exist for this stuff yet or, you know, the, the financing's not here or, you know, like most of the work I'm doing right now, you know, is, is that, you know, in a place where there's a bad economy, how are we going to manifest our company and get bigger and take advantage? And, you know, there's all these, there's all this information about how at the darkest times in American economic history, you have the building of some of the biggest companies, et cetera, right? So a person might be able to be proactive in their business life, but on the flip side, say, well, their marriage is the way that it is. Right or that the, or their health is the way that the way that it is and and so wherever a person finds this sense of I wish I was different I wish things were different you have to plug in at that moment and ask yourself if it was different what would it look like right how do I develop a vision around the things in my life that I'm not happy with. And how, again, you, you don't even, we, some of us are so mired in the nonsense that we don't even think about it, right? But, but there could be no, again, and, 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 and it comes from like a, a deep sense of, let's say, frustration or a deep um, cynicism that it's like, this part of my life is so messed up, it'll never be fixed, right? The, the marriage is, is screwed or my health is screwed or I have to lose 80 pounds. How am I ever going to do something like that? Right? So the areas where we are the most frustrated, it's like we can't, we, we, we almost have, a, have a, 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 an inability to develop a vision. But then you think to yourself, but, but could the world, you think about what God, the, the, the Torah speaks about what the world was like before God created it. And it was like this deep, void, this emptiness, this overwhelming expanse, that just like the nothingness was tremendous. And, and God created out of that the entire complexity of the world with the words that he used, right? And that's an, that's an amazing idea because we think to ourselves, well, but that's God. But then there's a second Jewish concept that says that you're built in God's image. So just, and, and, and not for now, but that specific image, the ability to create something out of nothing, right? That's this, literally, we call it Selim Elohim, the spit, the, the, the image of God, and, and Jews have lots of different names for God, and because each name represents a certain ability or facet or manifestation, that's the manifestation that we are built in the image of, not in the other ones, right? We have this ability to build out of nothing. So if a person looks at their life and says, you know, 
I have a something, but my something sucks, right? So even that, already at that point, you can start to envision and to put out there what you want that to look like. How can you make things look different? And, and, and as soon as you start that process and you can develop that, that, that idea, again, this is a Jewish idea, but Stephen Covey says it in, in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You have to begin with the end in mind. You have to unabashedly, with, with no holds barred, think about what do I really want? What would be amazing for me? How do I have this vision if I would just let myself go and think and not worry about the practicality of it? But how do I, again, and Viktor Frankl says the same idea. He says that if you have a why, you can, you can stomach any how, right? So the how is irrelevant in most cases when you begin this process. So if a person finds themselves intrinsically frustrated, angry, lost, dark, all of these kinds of things, right? What's the first thing is to develop a vision to look at how the world, how physicality started by manifesting itself, which was that God was talking into existence the future, right? That was his idea. He built time and then he built physicality. And so when you have time, you have a future. And when you have physicality, you have what to build with, right? So that's this concept of leveraging and borrowing and building your future. So if a person says to themselves, Right again, even even if you look at that sense of of the imposter syndrome, so to speak, right, where you're thinking to yourself, God, I don't belong here. This is super awkward. If people felt like if they knew like who I am or what I'm doing, I would never be able. I I couldn't be this person, right? If even that concept, you start to think to yourself, I want to imagine that I could be in this position where I feel good enough about myself, that I could just focus on the people I'm serving, or I could just do my best job. And, and, and then you start to envision, what does that look like? And do you feel comfortable in that place? And how does that whole thing work? So that's the first piece, is that you have to develop a powerful idea for what the future is supposed to look like. Whenever you feel, in any area that you feel, and again, we are not supposed to live mediocre lives. And and if you have a sense like everything's good in this one area or I'm super blessed in this area, but this other area isn't good, well, the fascinating thing is that we are multifaceted. So if everything's good in this area, great. So be happy about that. But then the other areas that things aren't working, you have to think to yourself, what do I want this to look like? And ultimately, you have to generate that vision for your own life. That's the, that's the very important step number one. Now, step number two is when a person finds themselves sitting and and uh, feeling frustrated that they haven't gotten there yet. Because again, the mind, and this is a this is a Hasidic idea and every other idea, right? It says that you are where your mind is. So if you're sitting there in this glorious future where things have already worked out for for themselves, and and you're like, I've gotten through this problem in your head. Right, but then you look around and you're still mired in the muck. You still have all the weight to lose. You still have, you know, your business in shambles or wherever it might be. Right, and so then you have a tendency to get very, very frustrated. And also from that concept, you have to build from the physical world, which is the physical world is an organic process. Everything is organic, and it's fascinating because we have a holiday, one holiday a year, the holiday of Passover, where God, so to speak, jumps and breaks through nature. But if you look at the rest of the world, and even immediately following the Passover holiday, what you see is that there is an organic process that a person has to go through in order to change their environment. And nobody likes to see that, right? Why is the diet industry a multi-billion dollar industry? Why is everyone, all these coaches online talking about, buy my program for $3.95 and you'll never need another program again, right? There, the, the world is so rife because we so hate, on one hand, that process. This process that we're thinking to ourselves, I have to sit down and I have to do the work and I have to learn how to be patient, right? Everybody in every area of every component wants to find that magical pill. And there are so many witch doctors and there are so many people out there of every stripe color that wear every kind of outfit that want to promise or talk about this fact that if you just come again, there's a, I just uh, somehow I've been, I've been uh, targeted by a certain kind of Facebook ads. It's like, watch my seminar and then, and, and, and you never have to talk about, you know, let's say, you know, build your marriage and, and, and how do you build your marriage? You watch my seminar and, and it's just you, your, your spouse doesn't have to be here. You watch my five hour seminar and, and, and that your marriage is solved for $500, right? And you think to yourself, God, 
maybe maybe this time that'll be accurate, right? And you pay the five hundred dollars, or this this marketing class, and suddenly your business is gonna be is gonna be grossing your wildest dreams, right? Or or take this supplement. Next thing you know, you're gonna have you know jack six pack abs and everything like that, right? And it's like, no man, it never works that way. And and if you want it to work that way, great. There's tons of people that want to take your money, but the practical reality of life is that you do not walk out in your garden and you start screaming at the flowers to grow because you appreciate that you have to put the flowers in an environment where they can grow, right? And then wait and then go along the process. That sucks and that doesn't sell very well, right? But what is the what is the piece of information that you can utilize yourself to strengthen yourself through the very difficult process that we have of being patient? So the answer is you have to look at your life and you have to look back and think to yourself, has have I ever had the experience where in my life, I've seen organic growth. I've seen growing beyond a certain boundary. I'll share it for me. It was like the greatest, <laughs> it was the greatest experience, right? People think, well, I thought, right, that when, when I when I went to Israel, so I had never seen a page of the Talmud before. I'm, I don't know what it is, ADD, dyslexic, whatever it is. I can't sit. I don't like to sit. I hate sitting. It's it's terrible. And I, you know, I go from being like this hyperactive kid to a to a yeshiva program, right, where where it's like 12 hours where you're supposed to sit and you're supposed to study and you're supposed to study a language that I dropped out of. I dropped out of Hebrew three times in college because I couldn't sit in, in master language. This is like not Hebrew. It's Aramaic, so it's like even even more challenging challenging and whatever it might be. And so I sat there and I, and I sat and I didn't sit for that long. And I was, you know, I was out talking because of course you have to save the world, not really save the world. I just didn't want to sit inside and schmoozing. And I would go buy snacks across the street and whatever it was. But uh, over time, eventually, I, I think it was just that I was such a nu nuisance. I started getting bumped up classes and I was sitting in one class and it was way past what I was able to do. Right. But they felt bad that they kept me in the introductory program for like, you know, a really long time. And, um, and this rabbi asked me, hey, can you read this piece and explain to it, to the class, how that question that you're reading is relevant to the text. And I, I, I le le legitimately, I looked down and I started to panic, right? And I, and I, and I, I get skinny, he's like, I, I can't read, right? And what I did was I started to, I, I attempted and I was like, oh my God, I could read that word and I translated it and I could read that next word and I could translate it and I could read of the seven words there, I read a six of them and I translated them and I looked at the rabbi with a big smile on my face. And he said, so like, how does that plug into anything we've been talking about? And I said, I have absolutely no idea, but I just read that, right? And again, this is, you know, it's like I can read and I'm in a class of like, you know, uh, like, like 10th graders or something like that. But the fascinating thing that proved for me was, and what I walked out with that was, that I saw that I did have organic growth potential, right? And if you think about, again, look at your business, look at your family, look at where you are, uh, any of these things, when you think, Imagine where I was when I started. When I started on this process, what, how, how much did I know? Or what did I look like? Or what was my business doing? And if you see that you do have those incremental growth pieces, you have enough courage and faith to say, okay, I can sit where I am now, but I can have enough confidence to go forward in the future. So those are two fundamental ideas straight out of the Torah that address this concept of the future patient paradox, which is the antidote to a person feeling a sense of frustration over where they are in life now, which is where all of the depression and frustration and anxiety comes from, or a sense of um, imposter syndrome of, you know, I shouldn't be where I am now. I'm unworthy of being where I am now. The first point is to develop a vision for where you want to go and to be unapologetic about, uh, unapologetic about it. Again, it was none other than God, the source of all of infinite uh, infinity, right, that was starting to generate what does he want for the future? And we come from that. So you have to be able to dream big enough of what would this world look like that I want to build. And again, like I said, it doesn't mean jump on Instagram and look at other people's worlds, right? The, the concept is you have to learn how to be introspective. It does not mean, by the way, and I heard someone say this, like, I can't look at the outside world. I should look at the outside world. But ultimately, a person's supposed to project out from within what they want. You can gather data, look around. Oh, you know, this guy has this company. This person has this lifestyle. This person does that. Like, yeah, sure, you can see what, what resonates with you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to be thinking to yourself, what do I want? How can I generate that from within? And then on the flip side, as I develop that, and like we mentioned, there's that teaching from the Baal Shem Tov that says that, you know, you are wherever your mind is. So you're thinking, and I'm like, I'm, I'm now, uh, I've manifested, I'm manifesting, I'm, everything's great, whatever it might be. But then you like think to yourself, you're like, oh my God, this is awful, nothing's changed. And so that's the point. The second point, which is to look at the physical world 
world, which is a deeply organic process. And if you look at all of the, again, and this is a crazy thing, right? And this is also something like trip me out, is that Jewish holidays celebrate oftentimes the harvest. All of the different holidays are celebrating different stages in the harvest. And it goes over an entire year. And it's a progression. And you think to yourself, like, why in the world? Again, there's a there's a a, a cynical point, which is which is that, like, okay, well, you know, like the Jews, like all the other ancients, were celebrating nature, right? And and that's and that, <laughs> that's a really deep idea because we don't celebrate nature. We live in a world where we think nature shouldn't exist, and therefore I'm going to eat this diet product, and next thing you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have dropped eighty pounds, right? And 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 again, this is this is like a, a curse of our times. That and again, does it come from the 1960s? I have no idea where, but we have we have this 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 sickness within us that a person thinks to themselves, the ancients didn't know as much as we know now. And you're right, you know, they, they didn't have an iPhone, uh, but, but, but they knew a lot more than that. What did they know? There's a, pr there's a pr principle, there's a spiritual quality, there's a piece of tremendous wisdom when it comes to learning to celebrate the different, the different stages in the natural process. If you think about a harvest, there's the planting stage. You need to enjoy the planting stage. There's the, there's the growing stage. Then there's the harvesting stage. And then there's the sense that you bring, you know, once you've brought it all into your storehouses, you're able to sit back and relax. But again, but what's coming on the other end of that, which is always fascinating, the same process is just going to repeat itself. Right? So if a person has that appreciation to see spirituality, to see the infinity which is cloaked in nature, not only will they be able to envision a perfect, a better, a more special, a greater vision of the world of themselves, what they're able to do, but then they're also going to have the fortitude. And again, you think about that. This is such a beautiful idea going back to the Jewish holidays. Right? It's like, it's not just like, hey, cool, grain. Right? It's like every step I appreciate in the organic process. And you have to learn how to find those little things. Set the small benchmarks for yourself in order. Again, that was for me. Like I when I when I when I start a fitness journey, so to speak, I'm like, oh God, I'm never gonna be able to get back there. It's gonna be so hard. And the reality is what I had to do was just to set up for myself, I just need to get enough inspiration, which I know takes me about three to five days, right? Where I can kick my sugar and addiction so that I can get motivated to start exercising. So instead of being like I have to be inspired for six months or six weeks, whatever it might be, it's six months, right? Um, I just said, I need to get through three days where I can click in. So it's again, that idea of, of celebrating the natural process, but also putting in um, a, a, a easier check marks to and, and celebrate those check marks amongst the way. So those were the two concepts that I that I hoped was relevant in, in order for a person to kind of break through this limiting um, this 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 limited mindset that, that plagues so many of us and this frustration in the fact that we just want to be different already and like why is it taking so darn long and 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 also this idea that I I can't even imagine again most people right they never they always ask they think to themselves. I can only imagine a situation that's a little bit bigger, a little bit less bad, right? That I suffer a little bit less than I am today. And that's totally not the way that, that, that Judaism looks at anything, right? And that's not the way that any inventor or innovator looks at anything. Because if you want to just be a little bit better than today, right? So like, you're probably not going to be. You have to imagine what would be the best case scenario here. And then how do I walk it back and create a process? And you're right. Maybe the, the net result would be that your your day is just a little bit better. That's the whole concept of if you, if you shoot for the... The, again, I think it's I probably Kanye West that said it, but if you shoot for the moon, you might land on a star. I know that uh, astro, astrology, astronomy wise, that's not true. But setting your big vision and in order to bring yourself out of the of the of the uh, to move the needle a little bit, you have to set a big vision. So I appreciate very much. I hope this was valuable, and thank you so much for listening.